Oh, so good morning, and let's close the eyes. <clears throat> Take a moment or two to simply arrive. And as you're sitting here with the eyes closed, just notice first how you're feeling physically and mentally, what you're carrying with you this morning. And also notice what it is that's on your mind and in your mind. What types of thoughts and intentions are governing your experience of your life path today? What knowledge, what wisdom are you embracing? Knowledge or wisdom can be subtle. It can appear in ways that we don't even recognize that it's actually wisdom visiting us. Um, Or it can be like a clobber over the head, you know, a major epiphany that wakes us up in any given moment. So how is wisdom with you today? Are you receiving subtle vibes of information and remembrance Or is there a huge epiphany that's happening? What does wisdom look like for you today? Is it something you think you know about yourself, about others, about the world? Or is it just a deep knowing that leaves you feeling peaceful? Now, there are multiple levels of wisdom. You know, there's the wisdom that is a deep knowing, and then there's the wisdom that causes us to become um, confounded by the ego with judgments of others. And that's not really wisdom, but it is. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it's, it's the ego's idea of wisdom, is to say, I think I've got this down. I know what this is all about. It's the ego's idea of wisdom. It's like, I know I'm smart. But the heart's wisdom is a wisdom that is all-inclusive and encompassing. And it, it allows us to simply be present to whatever is happening. The beauty of a sunrise or the sunset, the migration of the birds, the dipping temperatures, the rain, the sun, whatever. It allows us to recognize that there's a consciousness moving through each of those experiences and we are part of that consciousness that's a high wisdom that's a really high wisdom and so today we talk about wisdom and about steadfastness and wisdom and talking about steadfastness you know we started off before we turned on the recorder talking about how one thing can happen that causes us to become shaken um, in our own understanding of uh, perhaps our self-value. And as a result of that, every single thing that was ever said to us in our lifetime comes back to visit us again. And it seems for a moment that all of the work we've done for the past year, five years, ten years, is swept to the side for the sake of revisiting these old haunts. You're not good enough. You're not this enough. You're not that enough. You're too much of this, too much of that. And let's just say five years of self-study, of coming to recognize that you are a whole person as you are, and there's nothing lacking about you. That all gets swept away in a moment of doubt. And that leads us, no matter who we are, into a downward spiral of self-negation and questioning. Steadfastness in knowledge requires questioning, but it doesn't require that kind of questioning. Right? When we are questioning the validity of our own wholeness. And we're asking in a way that illustrates 
how intent we are upon experiencing that wholeness, that we, we want to experience that wholeness. We, we want to heal the wounds of the past. We want to understand ourselves as a whole being. But I have a couple of questions to ask about that, about how I overcome these other obstacles that keep me from that wholeness. That's a fine path of inquiry. Because its end result, its goal, if it were to have one, would be the experience of wholeness. But when we say, I know you keep telling me I'm whole. I know other people keep telling me I'm whole. I know I'm supposed to feel like I'm whole. But what about what happened 10 years ago? What about what happened five years ago? What about what happened yesterday? These things all negated my wholeness. Weren't they right? That's not a useful line of inquiry. Because its goal is not to experience wholeness. It's to justify the past. And potentially justify the words of someone else. Or the feelings or the harm that someone else committed. Or to invalidate them. And we cannot be actively invalidating the past verbally, emotionally, mentally, intellectually, and also embracing the present moment. We can't do those two things at the same time. We have to be in one place or the other. So we're either battling the past and filling our head full of self-worth questions that really don't have an answer because they're not genuine questions. Does that make sense? Or we're practicing our wholeness and saying the past is the past and what anybody said to me or said about me no longer matters. And it probably didn't really matter then either except that it hurt at the time and left an incision in the energetic aura of your being, a little wound that needed to be healed eventually. And where we all have gone awry is that we looked at that wound and we thought that it was life-threatening. And we allowed it to become a gaping hole in our being. And we allowed it to define who we would be for a little while. And then when the opportunity came along to sit with this idea of what it is to be a whole being, we're not only addressing what that could possibly mean to us, but we're also addressing this gaping hole that really in a lot of ways we are self-created. I can come up to you and say anything I want to. I can go up to you and I can say, I hate you, I love you, you're this, you're that. It doesn't matter what I say to you because I'm not really talking to you. I'm talking to myself. No matter what I say, I'm not really talking to you. No matter if I say you're good, you're bad, you're evil, you're a saint, you're everything I want to be in this world, you're nothing I want to be in this world. I'm not really talking to you. I'm talking to me. So what I say to you shouldn't matter. And that's what, what Swami G and all these other teachers mean when they say MYOB. It's none of my business what you think of me. Because you're not really talking to me. You're talking to you. When you're talking, you're really talking to you. And if you tell me you love me, what you're really saying is, I love myself. And I love myself enough to open a window to love you too. When you say, I hate you, you're not saying you hate me. You're saying, I hate myself. And in some ways, understanding that we're always pretty much only talking to ourselves allows us to control the conversation to look at it and to decide where we're going to take this conversation to. Are we going to take this conversation in a direction that makes that gaping wound even bigger? 
and leaves us questioning even more deeply our own validity as a human being? Or are we going to take that conversation, that internal dialogue, in a direction that explores our oneness, our unity, our wholeness, and leaves the statements in the past in the past, not feeding them energetically any longer? In yoga, we say, become steadfast in wisdom. To become steadfast in wisdom, we have to leave things where they belong, even if they still hurt. Yes, and they do still hurt. I still have lots of things in, in, from my past that hurt on a day-to-day basis, you know. I can't think of my mother oftentimes without, without having a, a, a tinge of, of something, you know. But, but then I guess that what I have become somewhat skilled at is the moment that that takes hold, I counteract it. Instead of saying, oh, my mother, da, 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 and getting lost in that dialogue with myself, which I'm very capable of doing, I say, I'm having a thought about my mother that's bringing me a feeling of being in the past. And in this moment, I'm going to actively choose to remember her with kindness. to remember her with love and to send a little prayer her way that no matter where she is today, that she is knowingly on her path, steadfast and existing in a state of love. Because to be honest with you and to be honest with myself, I have to admit that I do not recall the entire conversation that we ever had. I know catchphrases. I know one word here, one word there, the ones that stuck in my mind, you know. I remember when she said something to me like, um, you should just get over it. But I don't remember the entire conversation. Don't you remember the negative things? Right. Or the excessively positive. Right? We remember either the excessive negative or the excessive positive. It's like those people who look back at high school and say, I want to go back to high school. It was so amazing. It's like, no, it wasn't. (laughs) And then if you start talking with them a little bit about it, they're like, yeah, I don't really want to go back there either. But they have a romanticized vision in their mind. And it's not to say that it's wrong or right or accurate or inaccurate. It's to say that it's not happening now. And if it is not happening now, why are you still putting energy into it? Other than to resolve it. Why are you still putting energy into it? Other than to resolve it. And what is it that we wish to resolve it toward? Well, if we're staying within the steadfastness of wisdom as yoga talks to us, we're resolving it so that we can be in this present moment, understanding our own wholeness and the wholeness of all other beings and everything that is. But if, if we're caught in a line of inquiry... That is, 80% of the time asking why that happened, why that happened, what did that mean, what did that mean, why did that happen, why am I still thinking about that, what do you think about that, what do you think about that, what do you think about that? Then the question that we're not asking is this. In this moment right now, how do I recognize my own wholeness? In this moment right now, What do I need to put down to recognize my own wholeness? In this moment right now, how do I become present? In this moment right now. See, I can't ask that question and ask the other one at the same time, right? I can't ask those two things at the same time. I am either working in the past or I am working in the present. I can't do both at the same time. I can't say, Chad, will you please tell me why 15 years ago such and such happened? And by the way, can you tell me also right now how I can be present in this moment? 
You can't, you, you can't answer both those questions at the same time, and I can't work on both of them at the same time. It's one or it's the other. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then the ego will effectively take you wherever is most attractive to it. <laughs> it's like cookies. It's like, yeah. <laughs> so if today's favorite cookie is chocolate chip and that's in the past, yeah, yeah then oatmeal's out of the question, yeah. you know? It's so true. So we need to look at the line of inquiry that we're engaging ourselves in and ask ourselves. And I'm not saying stop asking questions. That's not at all what I'm saying. And I'm not even saying stop asking questions about the past. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is how are you phrasing those questions? How are you conducting that inquiry? Are you conducting that inquiry in a way that keeps you in the past? Or are you conducting that inquiry in a way that opens you up to the present moment and to all that you really are. <clears throat> to be steadfast in the wisdom of yoga is to be present in this moment with an endearing and, and engaging love of the divine. And to be honest with you, I, I don't think the divine really cares what happened 15 years ago. I don't think that it's on its radar. The divine is a constant flow of consciousness. You ever look into a kaleidoscope? Right? And you make the little turn, and you get to to uh, you know a design, and you're like, "Oh my God, that's so beautiful! I love that!" And someone comes by and knocks your arm, and that design is now gone, and the new one has appeared. Is the kaleidoscope bitching and moaning? Put back the other design. I like the one that came before this. No, the kaleidoscope is just the the design, and it's just engaged in that moment. I don't know. To me, that's kind of the universal consciousness. It's like, it's not, it's not in the echoes of the past. That's the function of our mind. It's in this present moment. And it's saying, you are radiant, beautiful, amazing, complete, whole as you are right now. Yes, hold a space for the past. Hold a space to mourn what needs to be mourned, to, to mend what needs to heal. But don't forget, that if you choose to be there, you can't be here. What else? So how can how can our like how can us remembering the past help us in like the present moment? It's acceptance. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that word. Mm. It's acceptance, right? It's acceptance. It's looking back and saying. And I can only give you my own example, you know, and, and we've all talked about, you know, relationships that we've had. My, my relationship with my mother became a peaceful relationship when I accepted the fact that it would never be what my ego told me it should be. And then, and that took a long time. That took years, you know. But when I was finally able to say, <clears throat> with honesty, because I could say it with the dishonesty for a really long time. I don't care. <sighs> you know, but I really did. But then the day came where I was able to say, I recognize that she did the best she could. She really did the best that she felt she could, or she did what she was willing to. And I can't change that. I can either accept it and and acknowledge, you know, or not. And if I don't, then I know I'm going to be just going over this and over this and over this and over this in my mind more and more. And the wound is just going to get bigger. So what do I need to do? What do I need to accept in order to be able to accept the fact that in every moment, she did the best she thought she could. And the answer came to me one day in meditation, where I thought to myself, who is she? She's, she's, she's passed away now. But, but who, who was she in her life? How much do I really know her? You know? And I thought to myself, well, I have snapshots I know that 
she was a nurse. Um, I know that she had scoliosis and had a significant surgery at the age of 16 that kept her in bed for a year. Um, I know she fought with her mother, my grandmother. Um, I know that she had uh, two marriages that didn't work and both were very violent. I know that, um, you know, a couple of other things, right? And then I, I started to kind of refine what I knew. I said, well... I know that couldn't have been easy. Yeah. You imagine being a 16-year-old girl in the 1950s, 40s, in the 1940s, I think. Right, 27, 37, in the 1940s. Being a 16-year-old girl, having had spinal surgery that left you in bed for a year, strapped down so you couldn't move, face down to the floor, I started meditating on that for a while. And this is not to make excuses, but this is to understand the human psychology of a person. Take me completely out of the picture. Who was she as a person as a result of that? How many times did her heart break as a 16-year-old who couldn't play basketball with her friends? who should have grown to be over six feet tall and instead, because of the surgery, was left at five foot nine. What kind of pain did that bring into her body, you know? I started meditating on these kinds of questions and taking myself completely out of the picture. What is it to be a woman in the 1950s going to college to become a nurse, knowing that there's a ceiling that's a much different ceiling than there is today? I started asking myself these questions and meditating on who, who she must have perceived herself to be and how strong she must have been to survive these things. But how also on the flip side of that coin, her heart must have broken over and over and over again. You know, relationship that was violent, you know, losing her dad, this, that, the other thing. And eventually I came to a point where I just started crying. And I thought to myself, my God, if this woman was my friend... If this was one of my friends, I would be holding her. I would be telling her, my God, do you even know how strong you are? Do you even know what you've been through in this life? You did do everything you thought you could do. And it doesn't matter if there was actually more in my opinion. There wasn't in yours. And that's where you were. And that's what it was. And now I have to ask myself, utilizing the steadfastness of the knowledge that yoga provides, I have to ask myself, now how do I move forward? Or just become present in this moment in a way that allows me to respond to the very best of what I perceive my ability to be. Does that make sense? Understanding and having compassion for the plight of others, no matter where it brought them. Yes. Responsibility. Absolutely. Yeah, what is my best? Because if I curse her and love someone else, that's not my best. Because... And, and why is it not my best? When it, it might have been, when I'm accepting it as it was hers, right? Because I know it's not. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I know it's not. Because I'm not accepting, I'm not accepting myself as a broken person. That is not my place in this life. That is not, at least not in this moment. That's not, that's not where I'm, that's not where I am. And so, so if I'm going to be honoring of her situation, honoring of my situation, honoring of all of your situations, honoring of all the people that I ever come across, of all the beings that I ever come across, what I need to recognize and be steadfast in is who I understand myself to be. And I 
used to understand myself to be a broken, angry person. I do not understand myself to be that anymore. I do not. I do not. I understand that I have sadness. I understand that I have grief. I understand that I'm still working through things that I will always be working through. But I also understand myself to be present. And I understand myself to be capable of great love. And I understand myself to be capable of compassion. And I am actively choosing to focus on that. Knowing through the steadfastness of the yogic wisdom that if that is the choice I truly, honestly make, the rest will take care of itself. The rest will heal. And the gaping wounds won't be there anymore. It's like, I'll put a little lightness in this for a moment. Have you seen the new video on Facebook about the, um, the, the unicorn who burps? Sparkles? <laughs> like sparkly dust. Like he, you know, like he, he, he uh, what is he? He poops colored ice cream. He, <laughs> he farts a rainbow. And he burps like sparkles. And there's a person, a guy, walking in front of him, and he does this. He burps, and the guy gets completely covered in this, like, sparkly powder, you know? (laughs) It's so funny. Ed is with me right now, so just give me a moment. Love is like that. You either allow yourself to become covered in it to the point that the other part of you is saturated as well as every part of you. Or you try to clean it off you know, for the sake of something that you think you should be. Yeah. When we bathe ourselves in the wisdom of yoga, what we're saying is, I accept the sparkles and the sparkly powder, and all of it. I accept all of it. I'll be bathed in that. And and I'll allow that to heal whatever I'm uncertain about. I'll allow, I'll allow that goodness, that beauty, that completeness, that presence, that truth to heal whatever I can't. And I know my limitations. I know that I am not capable of healing my past. It just is too complicated. So I either accept it, or I stay there for a while and suffer greatly as a result of it, or I allow it to be molded and kneaded and turned around within that dance of universal consciousness, which is love. And in that process, it becomes something else. And what it becomes is no longer a gaping wound that that I'm constantly trying to pacify. Instead, it becomes mm, a lesson learned, a life lived, uh, some exquisite memories. You know? It becomes a foundation that I can walk from, that I can move from, that I can stand on and not fall through. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think today's kind of, I know there was, we went from like one end of the extreme to the other, but basically the things to think about when we're talking about the wisdom of yoga and what it is to be steadfast in that wisdom is where are we placing our current focus and why? What is our purpose? If our purpose is to open ourselves to the experience of oneness in this moment, then we do need to look and ask ourselves, is the inquiry that I'm currently undertaking conducive to that? Or is the inquiry that I'm undertaking a very subtly disguised effort at keeping myself somewhere else in the past? or in the fear of the future, or in an alternate sideline, you know? And once I have this understanding, what do I do with it? 
once I understand that the questions I'm asking of myself matter, the frame of mind that I'm putting myself in matters, then what do I do with it? Accept it. If there's work there to be done, do it. But hold enough space so that you can start asking some questions that are pertinent to your actual goal. Your goal is not to understand the past. You cannot, and neither can I. Not in a psychological way. We, can't, we can rationalize all we want, but the reality is there's too many factors that are out of our control. There's too many things that we don't remember and that we don't remember accurately. So we can't understand the past. What we can do is have closure. We can accept that there will forever be a lack of understanding and instead accept closure through another format, you know, through another, um, through another level of inquiry or acceptance. And hold some space so that we can start asking questions that bring us into this moment, that allow us to be more steadfast present here now yeah. If you tried to put on your glasses that you wore 10 years ago, would you be able to see the same out of them? No. Do you try to put on your glasses from 10 years ago, psychologically? <laughs> <laughs> I would say we all do. Yeah, we try to see through the lens of our 15-year-old self, of our 20-year-old self, of our 30-year-old self. Yeah. But we need to put on the lenses that let us see today accurately, now. And in that, holding the space to ask the questions that are relevant to our current journey and our current goal. And in yoga they say, you know, oh, don't, you should not be attached to the outcome. Well, but there is an outcome. There is one. Otherwise we wouldn't be here. You know? What's your goal right now? Yeah. Um, just keep learning. There you go. What's your goal right now? Um, to connect and engage. There you go. What's your goal right now? Inner peace. There you go. What's your goal right now? Inner peace. Very good. What's your goal right now? I'm very down now. AKA, there's a few. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. What's your goal right now? Inner peace, resolution. Yeah. Resolution, mine also. Inner peace, absolutely. Uh, Remembrance. To remember more consistently, a also called steadfastness. (laughs) What was that? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So if that's what our current goal is, then, then the questions that we can ask ourselves, that we can hold space for, and maybe take back some of that energy from the past, is what do I need to do right now to do that? You know, what do I need to do right now to do that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's the dilemma, right? But you do know. You do know. We all know. And that's the reinforcing self talk. You know, you say you don't know. No, I know. And then you go through the reason. Right. Why? Yeah. yeah. Because I don't know. So just think about this for a second. I don't know is a part you played in the past. That is the response to somebody telling you that you're not smart enough. You're not intelligent enough. You're not wise enough. You're too young to know. You're, you're too whatever to know. So that response, in any moment, I, I don't know what I should be doing, is actually a voice from the past. Like two months ago passed? Sure. A week ago passed. Yesterday passed. Yes. But but built upon the deep past. It's, it's not just one thing. It's a pile of things, you know. 
Now, when you ask yourself, so, so what is it that I need to do right now in order to be um, working toward this beautiful goal of inner peace? What do you need to do? And you're not allowed to say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, just uh, whenever I get anxious or there's a time that I want to, you know, run or, or just energetically, like, not deal with something, just sit with that <clears throat> and engage and connect with that. Absolutely. Exactly. Cal, what do you need to do? Practice more self-compassion. There you go. What do you need to do? Just be inner peace. Just be inner peace. What do you need to do? Present and forgiveness. Ah. What do you need to do? Just pick one. You know what you need to do. Now just do it. <laughs> but you see, right? You do know. Mm-hmm. I, I had somebody once who was at a, at some sort of gathering, and it's like one of those people you meet, and they're like a spiritual person, and like know you know in like a way or whatever it was, and it was like interesting. And then I just started talking, and at one point I said, I don't know. And he was like, he's like, you know. And then he would make me say it, what I knew. And then I went through it, like, yeah, I do. And then, <laughs> I was, you know, we were kind of talking at another point in the conversation, I would say something like negative like that, like, I don't know. And he was like, stop. And then he would go, and he would like point it out. And it was amazing to see the radical shift that you could yeah. have when you just take that moment. It's so true. Yeah. It's so true. But often we just, and so many people you observe, or you ask them, and they just say, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's the go-to answer. It's like, I'm angry. With everything, I don't know. And you don't even to give the time of day to try. It's like, it's like the phrase, I'm angry. Yeah. You're not angry. Anger is one thing. And we have a tendency to bulk 10,000 different emotions into anger. So to take the time to unwind that and to say, what am I really feeling right now? What do I really know right now? And then once you start to unfurl that little web, you know, that complication, and you start recognizing what you actually do know, what you already know, then suddenly something happens. And a root takes hold. And it's a root that is probably uh, the most solid, strong root there ever was. And that root is the support that you need to no longer or less often go back there and leave yourself there. It's the responsibility to stay present. It's the recognition that to live in the past is not supporting you or the world you wish to see and live in. That existing in the past in a way that is harmful to yourself. I'm not saying that we don't have work to do. Of course we have work to do, but everything has its place. What I'm talking about is the day-to-day excuses that we give ourselves as to why we don't have to be here now because we run back there then. So this root, this responsibility, this, this level of awakening has an honesty to it that is very clear. Somebody said clarity before. Clarity, I think Michelle said clarity. It's very clear. Very clear. But then the ego comes in and says, but what about this? But what about that? But what about if other people don't like your newfound clarity? <laughs> they don't. Some don't. No, 
not your business, not your problem. <laughs> That's the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is, it's, it's not your business and it's not your problem what they think of you. Um, Anais Nin, the bud stayed closed up nice and tight inside of itself until the remaining closed became far too painful. I'm paraphrasing. And so it opened. How long can you stay closed up in yourself? Chained and bound by the words of the past until you explode because it's so painful. How long can you be that child, that abused individual? How long can you be that identity before, before it becomes so painful that you believe you can no longer recover? I woke up one morning and I said, that's it. Actually, I didn't say it. Somebody said it to me. Not somebody, but some. Said, get up, get out, or you're going to die, and you're not meant to. Now go. And I got up, and I got out, and I never turned back. And it was clarity. It was Durga Ma yelling in my ear, then kicking me in the butt. You know? Is stop looking back before you become hopeless, before you become so full of doubt that you forget your own goodness, that you forget your wholeness. Stop dwelling. Yes, there's work that has to be done, but you can do that work without dwelling and without becoming hopeless. But give yourself the opportunity to, to catch a little glimpse. I don't know if yesterday maybe it was in class or sometime recently I was talking to somebody. I said, you know, that imagine a child who is looking out that window and from the moment that child was born, all that child ever saw was clouds, black, black, black clouds and rain and thunder and lightning. And that's where that child understood this world to be. The child never saw the sun and therefore does not understand that the sun can exist. You know the sun exists. You know the sun exists. Unquestionably, you understand that the clouds come and go and the storms come and go and the sun is always there. So don't be the child who denies the sun. Don't don't settle for the storm only. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, kind of, sort of, maybe. <laughs> what was that? Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> My daughter used to say, Mom, you just left me under the bus. <laughs> I had three cars back. <laughs> that was her way of saying, <laughs> simplify. <laughs> so I'll say simply then, is that we have a choice. The wisdom of yoga and holding into that wisdom in a way that has steadfastness, that has consistency to it, requires that we know what we're thinking, why we're thinking it to some degree, and that we make a choice about where we wish to reside. We do have work to do with regard to our past. But there is a difference between working through and residing in. We live now, in this moment. This is when we are alive. Everything else is an echo. So make sure that the questions and the stance that you are taking in this moment is representative of this present moment and the completeness of this moment. And feed more energy into that because that is what is going to manifest the world right now. The world that you walk through, that you live in. If all we ever do, if all, and I'll just use myself, if all I ever do is reside in the body of that injured 8 to 10 year old, I will never be able to see the sun. I don't even want to. 
So best we come forward into now and bring forth our best self and acknowledge and accept and do the work, but be present because that's what's going to allow us to heal. So what do you think? What are your thoughts and ideas? Questions? Yes. Well, I just had a reflection kind of just reading the One River at Many Wells book. Which one? The One River at Many Wells. Mm, yeah. And there was, I don't know if it was a poem or just like a passage, but it, it said something along the lines of um, people who are sad worship the shrine of the past. It's true. But I thought that was so, that was just such a good analogy. Because I'm talking about all different types of religions. It's It's a great book. Yeah. Yeah. One of the ones for the spiritual leadership program. It is the shrine of the past. It is. We're worshiping that instead of the sun. Yeah. Yeah. Melancholy is not the same thing as sadness. We've taken melancholy and turned it on its head. See, we're, you know, we're not only spiritual beings. We're also physiological beings that have chemicals and balances of chemicals. And when our chemicals become imbalanced, we may from time to time experience melancholy. We may also from time to time experience genuine trauma, loss of a loved one or some life thing that happens, you know. And there's appropriate emotions that go along with that. Who's to say what that is? Because each one of us is different and each one of us needs a different uh, combination of medicines to heal. This sort of, ultimately we only need one, but you know, and as we walk through our day-to-day life, each one of us is gonna have a difference of experience. So So we, we look at these things and we say, well, melancholy has become ultimate sadness. It has become depression. We don't hold space for melancholy any longer. For the moments where you just kind of, you're not way up here and you're not way down here. You're just kind of, you know, there. Yeah. Yeah. And so because sadness has become such a rampant issue in our society today, and we have everybody trying to define what sadness is and what it isn't and all these other things, it has become a lot, especially in the Western world, about the past. It has become a lot about dissatisfaction with one's childhood. You know? I won't go off on that. But sadness, really, you know, the way early on before we became so complicated, there is a portion of that that's just melancholy. It's just, it's just, it's just being. And there's nothing wrong with that, and there's nothing right with that. It's just what it is. But then the ego comes in and says, well, well, wait a minute, I'm not content right now. I'm not excited. I'm not, I'm not having a party. Yay! It's because we have so much stimulus. Oh, my God. And that's why we, like, we go right to that extreme. It's or so true. Those extremes, we can't just be... Well, I mean, we can be sometimes. It was interesting getting that truck. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Because there's five versions of that truck. Okay. There's <laughs> Look, you know what I wanted? My goal in getting a car was getting a car with fabric seats. That was my goal in getting a car. That was the first goal. That was the first goal, to get a car that had fabric seats. And to get a car that had a center display that was large enough that I could see it. Because my eyes are getting weaker as I get older. And of course to have a car that had like really good crash ratings and things like that, you know. <clears throat> so so I, I, and I also wanted something that was going to be useful, you know. So I have Marika, and we've been doing a lot more walking and hiking and going places lately, and I want a car that's going to be comfortable for her to drive in. So I can't get like a little two-seater, you know, it's not reasonable. 
And I don't really want a sedan because it's not really functional, you know? I mean, we have things here at the ashram we gotta bring back and forth. So the element was great for that because it had this huge back area. So when we went down to Sedona, we rented a, um, a, a Nissan Frontier, which is a pickup truck, it's a little sporty pickup truck. And it was a great little car, but it's crash test ratings are horrible. And yeah, and there's a lot of, a lot of electrical issues and things like that. And people say it's a great workhorse. Um, but there were some things about it that I just, you know, I wasn't happy with. And, and one of the things was it had leather seats. I don't want leather, leather seats. So I, and I, and then I also, you know, after doing some of the research on it, found that I love Hondas. I've had a Honda for, I don't even know the how many years now. And I've never gone wrong with my Hondas. They're a simple car, you know, except the Ridgeline. There's five of them, you know. So, so the Ridgeline is the pickup truck. And they have the Sport, the LT, the XLT, the XLTE, okay. and the XLT Black Edition. <laughs> And each one has like really cool accoutrements. <laughs> Moonroof, Apple Match for your phone or Android, um, all these other things. Seat warmers. <clears throat> um, really big display screen. Eight inch display screen. <laughs> I'm like talking to my daughter and I'm getting caught up in this, you know? And I'm like, well, you know, I really like the idea of the moonroof. She messaged me back, Mom, when are you going to look at the stars while you're driving? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, okay, fine. I was doing it last night. <laughs> Were you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I pulled over to do yeah. it last night because they were stunning, they were weren't they? Oh, my gosh, they were so beautiful. <laughs> and then I said, well, do you think a three-and-a-half-inch screen is going to be big enough for, for me to see? She's like, Mom, your phone is like three-and-a-half inches. You know, you could see that just fine. Like, uh, okay. So I'm sitting there, you know, and I'm talking to these people, and and he's trying to sell this and sell that and sell this and sell that and sell this and that and the other thing. And I just looked at him and I said, I want fabric seats. Like, what one gives me the fabric seats? That one will be just fine. So I ended up getting the sport because it has the fabric seats. And the fabric seats are comfortable, and, you know, it's a little less harmful. You know, it's I, whatever the rest of the truck involves, but but at least I know the seats are fabric. And, um, and it has all the function that we need to have. Um, and there's not so many bells and whistles, um, but she's wonderful, you know? And I didn't need the eight inch screen and I don't need to be able to watch Netflix while I'm driving my car. <laughs> oh my God, I know. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely, it's crazy. I'm like, I don't need the Apple Match because I'm driving. Why do I want to look at Facebook while I'm driving? I don't need that, you know? So scaled it way down. And what did I get? I got a tent. And it's white. And it's what? White. And it's white. Yes, exactly. It's a white truck. It's got a tent. I got a tent. Yeah. Isn't that the coolest thing ever? To cover like mulch or like to sleep in? To sleep in. Yeah. Oh, how nice. Yeah, so I go camping. And then, and the, the, the back area is like the tent, the, the base. Those, that's very, that's very it's cool. pretty cool, I know. And I figure, well, that's great because I intend on camping quite a bit this year. You know. And, and then I got practical things. I got a net covering for when I'm moving stuff around. You know, and I got mud pans for the floors so that the carpet doesn't get ruined. But it's just, you know, it's kind of practical. Yeah, exactly. But I had to sit there for a minute and ask myself, what am I getting caught up in here? You know? What am I getting caught up in all of these, these bells and whistles? Are they really necessary? Is it necessary? So you can look at the questioning that you do to yourself about why this, why that, why this, why that, and ask yourself, is it necessary? right now. Some things are very necessary. Some things are not so necessary. It's not necessary for me to go back for the 100,000th 100, 100, time 
and try to justify my actions at the age of 15 or the age of 20 or even the age of 40 or even the age of 54. I'm 55. No. I can start letting go of that inquiry now because it's not helping me to reach my goal. And my goal is inner peace. So what does help me reach my goal of inner peace is knowing what I need to work on now. And what I need to work on now is all those things that you all said. So one at a time. Sit every day. Be quiet every day. Maybe read uplifting, enlightening materials, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, the sutras. Just be that. Practice. That's why they call it practice, right? Practice being peaceful. That's all. And eventually that takes root. And that root is really super strong because the more that you experience that, the more you begin to believe you can. The more you believe you can, the deeper your faith becomes that you can. The deeper your faith becomes that you can, the more you understand that that is what you're supposed to be doing. The more you understand that that's what you're supposed to be doing, the more alien some of these other things start to look like. The more alien some of these things start to look like, the less you want to indulge in them. The less you want to indulge in them, the more you want to surrender to the inner peace and to the oneness. Any other thoughts or questions for today? Cal. Okay. Really good talk. <laughs> well, thank you all for being in that talk and for being part of it. Yes, Chad? Just another question. I may have asked this before, and I observe it all the time, but it's in the mind loops that people get into, like being maybe present myself or with a group of people that are present and then seeing somebody going into mind loops or myself, um, how to most compassionately get somebody out of that mm-hmm. in a way to bring the whole room into the present. Yeah. Um, there's been times where I've had it done to me in ways from people that were abrasive but not, not compassionate. It was just what needed to be done to get me into I've also had it dealt with like silence and I've observed you do it with people with silence and um, other times I've tried to do it to people and it seems to be harmful people are like that was rude for you to like pull me out of that but but, you know because I'm just like hey I don't want to talk about this right now Mm -hmm. because people are just shooting at me with trauma and past things and in a loop and I'm like hey I don't know anything about that and I would prefer that we didn't talk about that right now like that's maybe how I dealt with it yeah and just because just cut it off right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going anywhere. <laughs> hey, there's something about straightforwardness, you know. Yeah, right. Right. So, you know, maybe that's what needs to when somebody's so. But see, you know, so it's just, not rude. Okay. It's not rude. One person is, is saying, "In this moment, I feel that I need to talk about my trauma, mm-hmm. and and put it on your shoulders for a while." And you're saying, "In this moment, I don't think I have the skills to deal with your trauma." Who's being rude? Yeah. Nobody. But sometimes it's in a public setting. Exactly. You know, and it's for me mm-hmm. to shut out somebody that can embarrass them, you know? Yeah. So, so typically, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can work with that. Mm-hmm. But one way that, that might be um, useful would be if a person has started to talk with you about something that you're not comfortable talking about. You can always say to them, you know, for a conversation like this, I would really like to be able to give you my 100% attention so that I can really hear what you're saying, but I'm kind of distracted in this environment right now. And I don't feel in my heart that I can be present 100% for what you're saying. So can we talk about this a little bit later? And the second thing that I would ask you is this seems like a pretty intense subject. And I'm not really sure that I have a skill necessary to address this in a way that's useful to you. So could I ask you to write something down for me? Just one thing that you hope to get out of our conversation with this. 
And then let's have this conversation full on. So you're not saying, oh, (laughs) you know. What you are doing is being a teacher. You're giving them direction. You're asking them to commit self-inquiry and then to reflect upon that self-inquiry in a way that is useful to them. Swamiji will say, um, when he first started coming to visit us, everybody wanted to spend time with Swamiji. And I'd be like, Swamiji, will you meet with people privately? And, he, and, and, and the first time he came, he was, oh, yeah. yeah. I said, okay. Second time he came, he said, Suda, they should have a question. They should have a question. They should not just come sit with me to sit with me. Time is of the essence. They should have a question. And the question should not be, why is the sky blue? The question should be thoughtful. And the question should not be, what is the meaning of my life? The question should be clear. So they should have a question that is both thoughtful and clear. So that's what I use as a guide. I just noticed that a lot of people don't think that way, you know, so you have to, it's hard to kind of find where people are at. Yeah. Like moving. So you can come back to this idea that if there's a piece of garbage on the ground, just because somebody else doesn't pick it up doesn't mean you shouldn't. Yeah. Right. So, so you're having a conversation, and just because the other person is not as, as perhaps well-versed or um, appearing to be in this moment as uh, contemplative, doesn't mean you shouldn't be. Yeah. It or just might mean. Yeah. Well, gossip is different. You know. Gossip is a completely different story. So the first one is someone talking about their trauma and offloading. Yeah. The second thing, gossip. Gossip needs to be stopped. Yeah. Do you understand what you're saying is harmful? Yeah. I know you don't like this person, but is there a way we can talk about them kindly? Mm-hmm. And you can say that and also say that in a group setting too. Sure. Absolutely. 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 100%. I understand that you don't like this person, but is there something kind we can say about them? Don't you think that they've got enough, enough of this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fine. It's, it's not, you know... Spiritual presence is not about walking on eggshells. It's actually about being clear. And clear is, I have the skill to deal with this, I don't have the skill to deal with this. I have the skill to deal with gossip. Stop gossiping. A person comes with a certain kind of trauma. Maybe I don't have the skill to deal with that. So I want to give them a reference of someone they can talk to, if I have that, or give them a suggestion of what direction to go in, or if I am willing to have an open ear, have some direction so that we're not both just flailing in the water. All of a sudden, a half hour goes by. Yeah, exactly. Feel drained. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've been in, in uh, community before where people start talking about somebody and I've turned around to them and say, do me a favor. I don't mean to be in, in imposing on the conversation, but I'd like you to just take two minutes and superimpose your own name every time you say that person's name. And then if you feel good about yourself after that, keep going. But I'm going to go get some tea. Anybody want to join me? Because they need to understand that what they're saying is harmful. It doesn't matter if the person is the biggest jackass in the world. That doesn't matter. What matters is that what is coming out of your mouth in this moment is hurting, harmful, violent. That is what matters. It doesn't matter who picks up the paper, the garbage on the ground. What matters is that the garbage gets picked up. And then whatever emotional attachment comes with that is the individual's responsibility to resolve. Yeah, so gossip is totally different. I've got no patience for gossip. Not, I'm not saying I don't gossip too. Everybody gossips. But, but, but there's a difference between talking and recognizing and then stopping or limiting and just verbal diarrhea mm-hmm. you know of a harmful sort yeah. yeah I mean you could say that what I shared with you about my mom is gossip she's not here to support herself she's not here to defend herself you know you're just taking my word for it that's a form of gossip is it not mm-hmm. but what's the difference what's the difference you're teaching And I'm not blaming. Yeah. I'm not blaming her. Yeah. Yeah. 
You can. So there's a very slippery slope, right? I had a, a, a woman who was teaching a workshop I was in one time, and this is gossip, because I'm going to share with you what she shared that was gossip. So this is like second-degree gossip. This is getting really, really deep there, right? So she came out, and she said she was going to use some personal examples um, in order to illustrate what she was teaching. And she started sharing some stuff about her family. And she became so irate that she is standing up on the podium cursing, saying just really... Harmful things. Very loudly. Crying. I know you all think that I, I shouldn't be like this, but, but I tell you, it's human justifying. Justifying. So, blaming, name-calling, justifying. Gossip. Talking. Recognizing, acknowledging my part, your part, your part, our part, acknowledging that everybody plays a part and that sometimes those parts are pretty and sometimes they're not. Not so much gossip. That's more lesson-oriented. And that saying, hold space because sometimes you've been the one with the pretty part and sometimes you've been the one with the absolutely horrible part. We all have. So don't get caught up when other people have to play the horrible part. At least you don't have to play at that time, you know? So you can be grateful to them that they're taking the brunt of that. Yeah, they're taking the brunt of the mother-in-law or the father-in-law or the the one, you know, who everybody's talking about right now. They're taking the brunt of that, and, and it's not you. So is there a way to support them even and say, you know, yeah, I'm not going to put any more on you. I'm not going to be violent toward you. That's the greatest gift you can really give anybody is don't be violent toward them. Don't be harmful to them. People don't understand sometimes how how women can forgive perpetrators or how parents can forgive the murderer of a child or 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 how a spouse can forgive a murderer of a, of a spouse or you know. People don't understand they're like, "Oh, you." Yeah. And it's like, "No. Carry that kind of stuff around for a lifetime. That's a really heavy burden to carry." And, and what they've done is they've asked themselves, what is my goal? Maybe they don't even know they did it, but they did because they got an answer. What is my goal right now? And is, is this supporting that? Or do I need to find a way to resolve? And we use a lot of catchphrases in our society right now. We say psychological this, spiritual bypassing that. There are such things, but they mean very specific things. They mean really specific things. So we shouldn't just um, kind of use them like we use the word anger. You know, fear is not anger. Grief is not anger. Disappointment is not anger. Vengeance or vengefulness is not anger. They're individual things. Anger is anger. Forgiveness is forgiveness. Spiritual bypassing is spiritual bypassing. Stuffing it is stuffing it. We should be clear what we mean by those things. I feel like you have to, for me, like, really simplify it. Like, if you're friends, it's, um, I'm going to say that again. I'm trying to keep it simple, and then I forget what word I'm uh, thinking. But two things you you were talking about in the beginning, I feel like is transference. Mm-hmm. What you were saying, like when you're somebody saying something to you, like mm-hmm. okay, that's re- or that's really how you feel. That whole thing is transference, right? And then, um, oh my gosh, what is the word that we think of? Huh? Oh yeah. Oh, or is it or is it projecting? Is it projecting on other people? Yeah, like that. Is it? That's what is that the word? Not transference. Um, but like that well, well trans. Of, like you said, of when somebody's saying something about you. That. So my understanding is that projection is when I am. Uh, it could be 
projection would be when I am uh, mad at one person and taking it to you. I'm projecting. I'm projecting my feelings about something else onto something else. And then, and transference is not too different. Oh, how did, how did, I think it was Besser Vanderkoll. He explained the difference between the two. I don't remember exactly what he said, though. I'd have to go back and review it. And transference is, is an inappropriate attachment of an emotion. You know, inappropriate, like transference. Um, let me go back and review it. We'll talk about that. Yeah, because yeah, I don't want to say it okay. incorrectly. Um, but they are very similar, the projecting and the transferring. Yeah, yeah, very similar. And I, I did just actually read something about that. And he, I'm pretty sure it was Bessel who, who differentiated them, and he used really specific words that were spot on. Very easy to understand. But, so. Okay, let's own. <laughs> when all else falls through. Yeah, the <laughs> other word will come back to me. Okay. Yeah. So take a nice breath in. Oh. Namaste. Ah. Let's see, projection could be if I'm angry at one person and I am projecting it to you and I'm, I'm dumping it, right? Mm -hmm. Transference can be when I'm giving it to you. So, um, like how you feel, really feel about yourself. Yeah, you know, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's always how you feel about yourself, always. Like what you were saying. Yeah. Would transference possibly be like, at times, my mom was very controlling. If I date a girl and um, uh, my unfinished business with my mother is mm -hmm. causing problems with her. Yeah, you transfer it over to her. Mm -hmm. Right. And you either expect her to be that way. Right. To fulfill that loop. Right. Yeah, or you are that way. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. I, I, I had that word in my head. <laughs> 